so I've been asked to give some tips today on teaching teenagers, um, particularly in terms of coming up with extension activities for them to do as homework. Um, so here is a kind of alternative um, title of today's session. It's a, perhaps a little bit more specific, but certainly not as catchy as tips for teaching teens. Um, and it's how to get teenagers to work effectively outside of the classroom. Now, those people who are, uh, Henry, we have a bit of a problem here because I can't read the text. Uh, can I? Oh, no, it's OK. It's OK. My mistake. Um, those people who are on Facebook uh, will know that Macmillan's done quite a lot of promotion um, for the conference. Um, and everyone giving a presentation was asked to come up with a quote. Um, and this was my quote, and you might have seen this on Facebook. Don't let your course book control you or what you do. Um, now, as a materials writer, as someone who writes course books, like Laser, for example, um, that's fundamentally important to me. Um, and I just want to read you my full quote, because I actually wrote a couple of sentences beyond that. Uh, this was the full quote. Don't let your course book control you or what you do. You know your students best, and you know what works for them and what interests them. So you're the one who should be in control. Let the materials you use help you, not restrict you. Now, I just want to spend a minute or two thinking about this idea of materials restricting you. Um, because I think that can happen in two main ways. Um, there's, I guess, the most obvious way, um, which is when the, the course you're using doesn't allow you to do what you want it to. Um, and that can lead to feelings of frustration and disappointment. So, for example, um, perhaps the course presents phrasal verbs by main verb, by set or take, and you would rather that it presented phrasal verbs by particle or through the topic. Or perhaps the topics aren't appropriate um, for you and your students. Or perhaps um, the unit isn't structured in the way that you'd like it to be. And so, in a sense, the course has let you down. Um, now, of course, if you're using a Macmillan course, that's highly unlikely. Um, but there is another way, I think, that um, we can let the course restrict us. Um, and this is probably far more likely if you're using a course like Beyond or Laser or one of the Macmillan courses for teenagers. Um, and that is when you love the course so much um, and it gives you everything you need. Um, and that can, I think, lead to, I'm not sure it's quite the right word, but a sense of complacency. Um, so that you end up not extending the material from the course further. And you end up not personalizing it for your particular needs and your particular situation and your students' particular needs uh, and their particular situation. And I think that's a shame because however good a course book is, um, we don't know you and we don't know your particular students. And you do and you should always feel that you are in control of that course book material. Um, so with that in mind, um, in this session, we're going to look at some hopefully successful ways to get teenagers to supplement and consolidate their classroom work outside of the classroom, whether that's at home alone when they're working in their bedroom uh, or with their friends and families. Um, and I'm assuming that our students are already doing the tasks that we set them from the student's book. They're already doing workbook activities, probably at home for homework. Um, they're already doing tests, perhaps from the test generator or any DVD or CD-ROM, perhaps even from a website, a course website. Um, and that they're even perhaps doing uh, extension activities from Macmillan Practice Online. Um, and if you're using a Macmillan course, by the way, and you haven't checked out Macmillan Practice Online, please do, because it has uh, an enormous amount of extension resources and materials. And in fact, right at the end, um, I'll give you a link to Macmillan Practice Online. But I'm, I'm assuming for now um, that our students are already doing all of these things. 
And so when we start to talk about extension, we're talking about things above and beyond these components. And so we want to consolidate and supplement those things further, um, but of course, our students probably don't have a lot of time during the week. So I'm thinking particularly um, about work they can do at weekends and in the holidays. Um, and this ties in with what Robert was talking about in uh, the previous session, where, which he called projects. Um, and that's the kind of thing I want to talk about in this session. Um, now, I mentioned that this is outside of the student's book and the workbook, etc. Um, but in fact, I want to start by thinking about some extension activities that we have at the back uh, in the end matter of laser. And these are web quests. If you're using laser already, I hope you've, uh, you've come across the web quests and have started using them with your students. Um, for the lower levels, for laser A1 plus and laser A2, um, for every two units, there's a song, and then the next two units, there's a web quest. Uh, here's an example. You probably can't see it very clearly, but there's the song on the left and the web quest on the right. Um, and for the web quest, there are 10 topic-based questions based on the topics of the previous two units. Um, this is from laser A1 plus, uh, and one of the topics was celebrity. So there are questions about Beyonce and Jay-Z, for example. Uh, at the higher levels, laser B1 and B1 plus, um, we don't have songs, so we have more web quests, web quests for every two units. And then at laser B2, we have a web quest for every unit. Um, and this is slightly different uh, because all of the questions are more closely connected. Um, and so students can use the answers when they've got all of them uh, to write a short paragraph based on the topic. So the web quests are slightly different at each level, but they're all the same in terms of what they achieve. And what they achieve is in a fun and motivating way, they develop our students' digital literacy skills. Now, maybe you attended Steve Taylor Knoll's session on Monday, where he was talking about exactly this, um, particularly in terms of information literacy being able to find information online. Now, most of our students, uh, using Robert's phrase, are probably very tech savvy. They can probably do this brilliantly in their first language. I would like to think that I can do all of these things brilliantly in English. Um, but if you ask me to do them in Mandarin Chinese, I'm not going to find it nearly so easy. So they do need, I think, some practice when they're doing it in English. Um, and there are a number of different skills involved. Um, there's the skill of actually selecting the keywords. What do you actually write in the search engine? Um, if you've got a question, for example, Jay-Z was born in 1969. In which month? What do you actually write in Google? Probably something like Jay-Z birthday. And, and then you get a page of links. Um, and you've got to select which link to click on. So you might skim read and just check that they're appropriate and then scan to find the right keyword or phrase. And you choose your link and you click on it and that brings up a web page. And you then probably skim that to check that it's relevant. And if it is, you then scan it to find the required information. So a very important set of skills within a fun task. Now the question is, how can we then extend that further? And one very simple way um, is when students are doing this task, you get them to come up with their own questions related to the topic. Now, there are a number of different ways you could do this. Perhaps the simplest is they're going to find 10 answers on 10 different websites. For each website where they find an answer on each web page, when they found the answer, they go through the page again and find some interesting piece of information, and then create a question based on that information. So they then have their 10 answers for the web quest, and then 10 questions of their own. Now that then leads to a key question. They've got 10 questions, and every student has got 10 different questions. 
how do they get their questions to the rest of the class? Now, traditionally, they come back to class the next day and they've got their questions written on a piece of paper. What would they do? Maybe they would come up to the board in turn and write their questions down, or the teacher would write them down, or they would say them aloud and the other students would write them down. And very cumbersome. Or perhaps each set of questions would be photocopied and handed out to all the students. Very, very cumbersome. But there's a much more modern and much more effective way of sharing that kind of student-generated content. And that's using some kind of online class forum. Now, uh, Robert mentioned Evernote, which is a great example. That's not in my list. Um, there are a whole load of different ways you can do this, uh, and I know that a lot of you do this already. Um, for me, the easiest one, and the best one, because it's free and cheap, cheap and simple, or free and simple, is probably to create a Facebook group um, for you and your students. Um, and as Robert said, probably a good idea to have an acceptable use policy that the parents sign up to first. Um, you might want to use uh, Google Hangouts, which um, the Macmillan Conference is using, because that's got video conferencing facilities. Um, or some kind of school website, or school blog, or a Tumblr site. Um, perhaps you'll even share content using Dropbox, or an app like Viber, or WhatsApp, or there are loads of others as well. Um, and that opens up um, a whole range of possibilities um, that aren't really quite so possible if you're just using pen and paper. Um, so I'd like to ask um, a very quick question using the poll facility. Please don't write your answers in, in the chat box. Um, and please be honest, we should have, well, don't, don't press yet, don't press yet, I'm going to clear it. I'm going to clear it, I'm going to start again from now, okay? Um, click yes if regularly with teenage students you use some kind of online class forum, whether it's a Facebook group or Facebook page or whatever it is, and click no if you don't regularly use some kind of on online class forum. Uh, and let's see what we've got. We've got 573 people in the room yet at the moment. Uh, so far, the no's are winning by a mile. Coming up to 93 no's, nearly 100 no's, 30 yeses. Let's just wait a second. Uh, don't write in the chat box, please. Uh, just use the yes and no in the poll. Uh, while you're doing that, let me just have a look at some of your comments as well. Some of you use WhatsApp. So definitely the no's are in the majority here. Coming up to 150 no's, 45 yeses. That's really interesting. I would like to encourage you today to try it. Those people who click no, please try to create an experiment with some kind of online class forum uh, that you can use with your cheap teenage students so they can upload student-generated content. Now, from now on, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to kind of assume that you do have that. But all of this, I think, can be done without it. It's just a little bit more cumbersome and a little bit more old-fashioned at times. Um, but I really would encourage you, do try it, because it will open up a whole world of possibilities for you and for your students. And I want to explore that world a bit now. Um, and I want to mention a few, I call them here principles. Principles of consolidating and supplementing. Um, that's just a very posh way of saying tips. Um, so tip number one, um, and this sounds obvious, know what you want to consolidate and supplement. Um, it sounds obvious, but if you're going to get students to do some kind of project, which was the word that Robert used, you should know why they're doing it. The more explicit you can be in your own mind why they're doing this, I think the better. Um, it may be in terms of consolidating their vocabulary, perhaps some topic vocabulary that you've just done, or revising some phrasal verbs that you did a week or two ago. And perhaps it's a grammar point that you've just done, the present perfect, 
or revising the passive that you did two or three months ago. Um, perhaps it's consolidating in terms of a topic, sport or education or crime. Um, or in terms of a skill, perhaps with speaking, you've been doing making suggestions or giving instructions using the imperative. Um, or in terms of writing, perhaps paragraphing. Um, so always have in mind what you're wanting to supplement and consolidate. Um, and here's the second uh, principle or tip. Um, and I'd be surprised if anyone disagrees with this. The more we can get teenagers to do things that they're interested in and or enjoy doing, the more likely it is that they'll engage with and complete and achieve the task. Now, once again, that probably sounds obvious, but I think it's particularly important with this kind of project extension task. Um, with the student's book and the workbook, they don't really have much choice. But with this kind of extension task, uh, if it's something that they're just not interested in or just don't want to do, unfortunately, the chances are they may well come back to class and say, oh, I forgot to do it, I didn't write it down, or oh, it was boring. And we really need to try and avoid that, if at all possible. Um, just in case uh, you'd like some evidence of this principle, um, here's a link to, and once again, you don't have to write these links down, there'll be a PDF of all the slides at the end. Um, here's a link to a very interesting website called The Fun Theory, thefuntheory.com. Um, and this was popular a few years ago, and I think it was actually sponsored by Volkswagen. Um, and in fact, a couple of the videos on this website have been doing the rounds recently on Facebook. Um, have a look at this if you've never seen it. And in fact, it's got some great resources for our students as well. Because um, what they've done is they basically tested this theory that the more motivating and enjoyable something is, the more it can change people's behavior. Um, and I'll just give you one very good example. Uh, there was a metro station which had uh, an escalator and next to it a flight of stairs. Uh, and everyone was using the escalator and no one was using the stairs. And uh, what they did was they turned the stairs into a giant musical keyboard. So as you walked up the stairs, it played a tune. And instantly, people stopped using the escalator and started using the stairs because it was a lot more fun and a lot more motivating and a lot more enjoyable. Um, and that's what we need to do with our teenage students, particularly for these kind of extension tasks. Now, I'm going to give um, several examples. Here's the first one. And in fact, with this one, I've chosen something that's particularly tricky. Um, writing, extending a writing skill. Now, it's very, very difficult to get, as you, I'm sure you agree, to get students motivated um, about writing an essay, for example, or an article. Um, so the way to get around that, I think, is to come up with um, a topic um, that they have very strong opinions about. Now here, we're focusing on the skill of writing, the sub-skill of formality. And the topic, this is just an example, I'm sure you can think of topics that your students will have strong opinions about. Um, the government has decided to introduce lessons on Sundays for state schools. This is the, the, the concept. Um, and I imagine that most teenagers would have fairly strong opinions about that. Um, and we'd start with a class discussion where we would discuss the advantages, and there's probably not very many of those, um, and the disadvantages to having lessons on a Sunday. Um, a great opportunity for students to express their opinion using the second conditional. If they introduce lessons on a Sunday, I would, etc. Um, and that I would is very important. It isn't just what they think, not just their opinion, it's how they would react. What would they do? Uh, if you're English, you probably just touch and go, oh dear. Uh, other students in other countries would have a demonstration and march and protest. How would your students react? And then once we've discussed that, the extension task, um, probably done for homework, is to produce a range of different compositions all connected to that topic in some way. 
Um, and you might get students to do this individually or possibly in pairs or maybe in groups. Um, and they each focus on one composition type, um, which is focusing on one level of formality and one register. And then at the end, we've got a whole load of different registers because we've got a whole load of different composition types. Um, can anybody think of, I haven't been looking at the chat, sorry, because I've been busy talking. Can anybody think of any composition types that might be appropriate for that particular topic? If you've got any ideas, email, report, formal letter, discursive essay, newspaper article, right, excellent. Letter to the department responsible, right, exactly, those kind of things. Brilliant, great, great examples. Here was my list, but those are kind of exactly the same. Um, a Facebook or social network or blog post, a letter to the Minister of Education, a letter to the editor of a newspaper. I won't read them all out, um, but a report, perhaps a poster advertising the demonstration. Um, maybe even a narrative, a short story. Um, it's not up there, but a poem, perhaps, or a series of text messages. There's a huge number of different composition types that we could get our students to produce. Um, and that leads to the next principle, the next tip. And this sounds obvious, perhaps, as well. Um, but once again, it's particularly important for this kind of extension task. You don't have to have all of your students doing the same thing. Probably with students' book tasks and workbook tasks, probably, not always, but probably, the students will always be doing the same thing. They'll all do the same reading. They'll all do the same listening task. They'll all do the same grammar exercises. But this kind of extension activity, I think, is different. They don't all have to do the same thing. And in fact, I would argue, often, it's much better if they don't do the same things. If a number of different students are doing different things and then they share things at the end. And I think that's true for uh, three key reasons. First of all, they can um, play to their individual strengths. Or the flip side of that, um, they can help strengthen and develop and focus on their individual weaknesses. Um, secondly, students have different interests. So if one student's very interested in producing a video, for example, we'll come on to that in a second, uh, and another student's much more interested in doing a word search, we should encourage that and allow that to some extent. Um, and thirdly, uh, and this is the point of having some kind of online forum, the content will be shared with the other students anyway. The traditional model of the students writing the composition and then they come to class and they hand it in to the teacher and it's probably only the teacher who's going to read all of the content that's been produced by the students. That's not applicable here. Here, they're sharing the content in an online forum and all of the students can see all of the content produced by the other students. Which need, leads to uh, the next principle or the next tip. Wherever possible, encourage peer-to-peer -peer or student-to-student -student commenting, correction, and feedback rather than doing it yourself. Now, that's partly a question of time. Uh, we're very, very busy teachers, and we don't have time to comment and correct and provide feedback on everything our students produce, particularly this kind of extension task where every student's producing something different. Um, but perhaps even more importantly than that, our students in their daily lives are used to commenting on content that other people have generated. That's what they do every day on Facebook. They comment on content that someone else has uploaded. So let's try and recreate the real world as much as possible, even in our online classroom forum. So we have an example there with the different compositions of written tasks, texts. Um, which is very traditional. Students have always written some kind of a composition. Um, but the heading up here is consolidating and supplementing, and then I put content in inverted commas. Um, and I just want to explore now 
um, what else we mean by content. Um, we often use this word content, I think, these days to talk about digital things online. Um, and I think it's worth exploring exactly what we mean um, and exactly what we can get our students to be producing. So it could be written texts like compositions, um, or it could be a text plus some kind of JPEG, photo, artwork, some kind of visual thing that goes with the text. Um, content is also, of course, video and audio. Um, and Robert was talking about this too. Um, it might be third party generated. So for example, a link to a YouTube video. Or it might be student generated using a smartphone or a tablet. Um, and I think as Robert said, it is so incredibly easy these days for students to use their smartphones and their tablets to produce student generated audio and video. Um, now, of course, there's a million different things that they could be doing. Um, here's just a few simple examples. Um, perhaps you've been doing the present perfect, um, and you've been doing the topic of work, not necessarily at the same time, but you want to combine them into some kind of consolidation activity that the students do at home. Maybe they interview a family member or a friend who speaks English, who's older, and who has a job, and they ask them, what have you done at work recently? Or what have you been doing at work recently? And then they upload those short videos to the online class forum. Or maybe they make a short play or a documentary. Um, Robert mentioned something like that for his projects. Or a video blog or a diary uh, using the present symbol of something you do every day, perhaps. Or maybe they have a particular interest, perhaps uh, one of the students is really into cycling. So you've been doing the imperative, uh, and they each have to make a short video um, connected to something that they're interested in. So the student who's interested in cycling uh, makes a short video on how to uh, repair a puncture. And they're using the imperative, and they're actually showing visually, they get a friend to hold the smartphone while they record the short video. Or it could be something really simple, such as, um, self-recording a pronunciation point, perhaps the two different um, pronunciations of question tags. One where you expect the answer yet, uh, you expect the answer yes, your name's Simon, isn't it? Uh, or where you've got expressed surprise because you've heard something you weren't expecting. Your name's Simon, isn't it? Exactly the same words in exactly the same order, but with different pronunciation. And students could record that uh, and then upload it. Um, I've just seen someone's uh, written in here, you need parents' permission, absolutely. As Robert said, uh, your school should have an acceptable use policy and you get your parents to sign up to that. Um, or it could be a grammar point or a song, there's all sorts of things you can do with audio and video. Um, or it could be um, a third party generated piece of audio or video, such as a link to a YouTube or a Vimeo video. But once again, try and tie it in with some skill or some grammar point or some vocabulary thing uh, that you've been doing in class. So it really is supplementing, consolidating, and extending something you've already done in class. So maybe, just for example, you've been doing the passive. Um, and the students go to YouTube, and they find a clip of a quiz show in English, maybe The Chase or Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, where there's a great question or set of questions which use the passive. Um, or there's a karaoke version of a song which uses a particular set of vocabulary or has a particular grammar point in it. Or maybe just it's just a short clip from a TV program or a movie which provides an example of some particular vocabulary or grammar or pronunciation or whatever it is. But it ties in in some way with something you've already done in the course. And um, content is all sorts of other things too. Um, it's online crosswords, and it's online word searches, and it's BuzzFeed style lists, and it's quizzes, there's millions of them online. Um, there's millions of free grammar tests and vocab tests. Um, do be careful, not all of them are good grammar tests. Some of them contain mistakes, some of them are not very well written. Um, you can make that part of the fun, as long as you spot the mistakes, 
you can get your students to take them, uh, take the test, but to find what they think are the mistakes in the tests. Um, it's jigsaws, it's all sorts of different things. Um, and it's all sorts of different things in all sorts of different forms. It might be links, it might be Word documents, it might be JPEGs, it might be screenshots, it might be comments, it might be video, audio files. Content is so many different text types in so many different formats. Um, and you really do need some kind of online class forum to make the most of all of these. Um, now I hope, or you might in fact be thinking, jigsaw, that's a bit of an odd one, Jigsaws are just pictures, aren't they? Um, how could we use that? Um, well, I'm a big fan of online jigsaws um, as a hobby. Um, and the other day, I went to an online jigsaw site, uh, and I wanted to see how I could use it, um, not in terms of a picture jigsaw, but in terms of a text jigsaw. Uh, so what I did was I wrote a piece of text uh, in a Word document, uh, in very big font, um, and I did, I then um, took a screenshot, and the reason I did that is because you can't upload a Word document as a picture, you can only upload a JPEG. Um, so I took a screenshot of the Word document, uh, and that, that I then had a picture file of the text. Uh, I then, on the Jigsaw website, uploaded, it's absolutely free, I didn't even have to sign in, I uploaded that picture, uh, or that text, um, and I chose, you can choose how many pieces, uh, what shape they are, whether they rotate or not. Uh, and I created a jigsaw. Uh, and there's the link. Um, as I say, you don't need to write it down now. You can uh, get the PDF of all of these slides afterwards. Um, so you'll just be able to copy and paste that into your browser. And if you're interested in uh, text jigsaws, um, it's just a very simple example. Uh, go and have a look. Uh, try and do the jigsaw. I think in, in retrospect, uh, I, chose, I think I chose 100 pieces, which I didn't think was very much. Um, but in fact, it took me quite a long time to complete this jigsaw. So I think if I was doing it again, I'd have chosen a, a fewer pieces. But do have a look. Um, someone's just put jigsaw spelling or suffixes, prefixes. Brilliant example. I think there's a million things um, you can do with jigsaws. Um, does anyone have any other examples of online content? If you do, put them into the chat box now. Hangman. Hangman's a good one. A game named Jeopardy. Yeah, excellent. That's a good idea. Angry Words. Yeah. Word Generator. Crosswords. Absolutely. Okay, here were some other examples that I had, but they're just examples. Um, songs. I think some people have mentioned that. Um, maybe from laser, from the internet, your own songs, recipes, um, a thread of text messages, uh, a diary entry or diary entries, um, some kind of comparison. Maybe the students, if they're interested, for example, in shopping, uh, they go to the Amazon UK website and they look at particular products and prices and then compare that to an online website from their own country. Um, I think there are millions and millions of examples um, of online content. And we should be encouraging, I think, uh, within the principles and the tips that I've, I've put on the slides, um, to be producing as much as possible as extension activities. Um, the final one on my list here is rebuses. If you've uh, ever attended one of my webinars before, you'll know I'm a big fan of rebuses. Uh, rebuses are pictorial representations of language. I think they're great fun and you can use them for all sorts of different things. Um, here's a phrasal verb. Um, would anyone like to tell me what this rebus says? Uh, just type up what you think it says into the chat box. Some people will get it instantly. Right, Carol's got it. Do up an old house. So the do is visually representing the fact that it's going up. It's the phrasal verb do up. Uh, here's another one. What's this one? Fall apart. Very good, Yolanda. Excellent. A uh, couple more. What's this one? Fall apart again. Very good. Yes, it is. It's exactly the same, but it's presented visually in a different way on the page. 
Um, if you've attended one of my webinars before, we've actually had this one before. Uh, what's this one? Under, it's under control. Very good, Anna. Exactly. And I think this is the final one. What's this one? What's this one? Mm, it's beyond belief. Shell 2, you were the first one to get it exactly right. Very good. It's beyond belief. Now those, of course, those are just text. Um, so it's easy to produce those as a Word document. And um, there are different kind of rebuses. Um, MyRebus.com, if you go there, they have a different kind of rebus where they give you a picture, um, for example, a picture of a book, uh, and then it says something like minus B plus L. So there's some kind of letter substitution, and that becomes look. Um, and then there's another website, rebus1.com, um, which is a combination of my type and the letter substitution type. So there are different kinds of rebus that you might want to get your students to experiment with. Um, this is my final slide. Um, once again, you don't need to write these down because Henry will explain uh, where you can get the PDF of all of the slides from this session. Um, if you are using a Macmillan course like Laser or Beyond, and you haven't looked at Macmillan Practice Online, please do, because it's got some fantastic uh, extension materials and resources um, for courses. Um, there are, of course, millions of things that you can download um, for free online. Um, sometimes you might download something and by mistake, um, you shouldn't be downloading it. It's illegal to download it. Um, please do avoid that. Um, and if you want to be absolutely sure that what you're downloading is you're legally allowed to download, there's a Facebook group called Free and Fair ELT. If you join that, they have links to loads and loads of things that you can download for free and you'll know that they are legal downloads that you're allowed to use. Um, there's millions of sites online which have information for teachers. I just chose this one. Um, someone posted it on Facebook this week and I saw it and I thought it looked very interesting edutopia.org, uh, and that's got some interesting social media resources for teachers. Um, of course, you can put free ELT resources into Google, um, and that will bring up millions and millions of things, but please, please, please don't illegally download things you're not supposed to download. Um, if you're interested in laser, uh, on YouTube, on the Macmillan Education site, uh, Steve Taylor Knowles and I have recorded almost two hours of material I think it's 31 videos of tips for teachers who are teaching laser. Um, so please do check those out. Uh, and if, you, if you're not my Facebook friend at the moment, and you would like to become my Facebook friend, that would be absolutely super. Please put my name into Facebook, uh, and I'm sure you'll find me. Um, I've talked a little bit long. I was told to talk for half an hour to 45 minutes. Uh, I've done 40 minutes. So we've got, that's all I want to say. I hope you found that useful. Um, but if anyone does have any questions, um, then I think we've got two or three minutes for questions. But I'll hand back over to Henry for that. Thank you, Malcolm. I hope you all enjoyed that talk, guys. I thought it was great. And um, I particularly enjoyed the rebuses at the end. Um, I didn't get any of them, but um, <laughs> I'll <laughs> definitely look into those some more. Um, as Malcolm said, everyone, we've got a few minutes still, so let's have some questions now, please. Um, just feel free to write them in the chat box, and then um, I can read out the best ones, which I find, and uh, Malcolm will very kindly answer those for you. So fire away if you've I'll got anything else that you will want to get off your chest. I'll give you a few moments to type. Let's see what comes in. Thank you for all your thank yous, by the way. That's very kind of you. I'm glad. <laughs> very <laughs> polite, isn't he? Um, okay, it's all, it's, all, it's all praise coming in, Malcolm. Oh, that's There's that's no actual question at the moment. <laughs> 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 it's an answer question. Badly received. <laughs> yeah, you've covered everything, it seems. You can ask me on Facebook. Yes, yes, you've got that there. So it's Malcolm Mann, everyone. And um, as Malcolm mentioned, the presentation is going to go online next week, so don't panic if you're worried about missing some of these links. Uh, you'll be able to get them from there. Um, yeah, 
the presentation is going to go up yeah. next week, everyone. Someone's on Monday. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Okay, well, it doesn't look like anyone's well, that's probably, probably it, then. Any questions? <laughs> that's a first. <laughs> yeah, it's obviously a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Yeah, you've covered absolutely yeah. everything. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so, um, Malcolm, do you want to just say a quick few words then to thank everyone who's here today? We had over 500 people, so I think... We, we did. Uh, I mean, that, that's absolutely wonderful. I mean, right thank you all very, very much for coming on. I, the dedication of ELT teachers never ceases to amaze me. Um, so thank you for everyone uh, who was here. And also thank you again to Macmillan for organising such a, such a wonderful conference. Quite super.